Hey everyone, this is Electrochemistry for AP Chem in 10 minutes or less. This video is meant as a refresher on some of the major topics in units 4 and 9 of the 2021 version of AP Chemistry. It's intended for students who have already learned the material and are beginning to prepare for the AP Chem exam. If anyone cares, it's going to cover the following topics from the AP Chemistry course and exam description. Let's get started. So before we can talk about actual electrochemistry first, there's a type of reaction called a redox reaction that we have to know about. So the word redox is simply a shortened version of oxidation reduction. And in these reactions, you'll have electrons that are being transferred from one atom in the reactants over to another atom in the reactants. And you can spot whenever this is taking place by assigning oxidation numbers to all of the atoms in the chemical equation and seeing if any of those oxidation numbers change from the reactants to the products. So let's use this equation here to practice assigning oxidation numbers. You can really quickly Google a set of rules for doing so, and in those rules you'll find that elements in their standard states like solid copper has an oxidation number of zero, same thing with solid silver, or the fact that elements that are ions have an oxidation number equal to their charge. So in silver nitrate, uh, silver is an ion, and since nitrate is a minus one, then I know silver has to be plus one, and that is its oxidation number. Applying the same rule over here, the copper ion must have an oxidation number of plus two. Anytime you see an oxygen atom, it's almost always minus two, the exception being a special compound type known as peroxides. So here I've got a minus two oxygen, and then over here I also have another minus two oxygen. What you're left with then is the nitrogen sort of sandwiched in between these two. If I know that the silver is a plus one, and these three oxygens contribute a total minus six charge, then I know that the nitrogen has to be a plus five. That's gonna get this whole compound to add up to a total net charge of zero. So here, my N is a plus five. And if you apply that same set of rules to the nitrogen and copper nitrate, you'll see it is also a plus five oxidation number. Now after you've written out those oxidation numbers, you can see that there are some definite changes taking place like copper, that starts off in the reactants as zero and changes to copper plus two in the products. Or silver that starts as a plus one in the reactants but changes into silver zero in the products. The fact that these changes are taking place tells me that this is indeed a redox reaction. I can go one step further and show how the electrons are being transferred here. Zero to plus two, that's copper's change. Zero to plus two means it's getting more positive therefore losing electrons, and since it's zero to plus two, it's gonna be losing two for the same reason. My silver change is, a, is gaining one electron to go from plus one to zero, therefore getting more negative by one. What I've just written out are called half reactions. Every redox reaction will be made of two separate half reactions, one where electrons are lost and another where electrons are gained. There's also labels for those two half reactions and we can remember those labels with a little mnemonic device, Leo says GER. Leo stands for loss of electrons, is called the oxidation. GER stands for gained electrons, is the reduction. Here, copper is losing electrons. So the copper half reaction is my oxidation, which makes the silver half reaction where electrons are gained, the reduction. You can also balance equations this way using what's called the half reaction method. After you've written out the two half reactions, you'll, you might have to multiply them to make sure that the electrons are equal here. I'd have to double my reduction, and then we'll add those two half reactions to get the net overall reaction. And that overall reaction is shown right here. Now we can use these redox reactions to do a very helpful thing for humanity. That is creating something called an electrochemical cell. And for AP chemistry, we're gonna group these into two general types. The first is galvanic or voltaic cells, and the second type called electrolytic cells. In galvanic or voltaic cells, you'll take a spontaneous redox reaction, that means it happens on its own, and you're gonna use that to produce electricity. That's where batteries come into play. And electrolytic cells are kind of the opposite of this. In one of these, you'll take a non-spontaneous redox reaction that would not happen on its own, but will use an external power supply to force it to take place. Let's start off by taking a look at a model for a typical galvanic voltaic cell. We need two separate containers called half cells. In each half cell, you'll find some water and chunks of metal in contact with the water. Those chunks of metal are called electrodes. Those electrodes are connected via a wire. That's where our electricity will eventually be produced. And it's common to see like a voltmeter along that wire so you know if your cell is working. 
To complete the circuit and allow for neutral charges in each half cell, we also need to connect each solution with a bridge known as a salt bridge. This is going to contain positive and negative ions that flow back and forth from one cell to the other. In that salt bridge, you can really put any non-reactive ionic substance that you like. Potassium or sodium nitrate are typical examples. So the idea is to really just choose a redox reaction like the one we talked about earlier with copper and silver nitrate and do that reaction inside of this cell as those electrons transfer from one atom to the other we force the electrons to travel through the wire as they do so and that's where the electrical production takes place so to set it up i'm going to choose one half cell to do one of my half reactions let's put the oxidation on the left that means i'm going to make my electrode out of solid copper and dissolve a salt to make sure that there are copper plus two ions in my solution. Copper nitrate is a good idea. That means in the other half cell I have to do my reduction involving silver. So my electrode will be made of solid silver and I'll need silver ions in the solution. Silver nitrate is a good salt to use to get those Ag pluses dissolved in that water. When all the pieces are connected, the electrons will leave the copper electrode, the solid copper atoms in that electrode, so they'll be traveling through the wire in this direction. When they get to the other end of the wire, they attach to the Ag plus ions from the solution. As they do so, the Ag plus ions will turn into Ag solid. You can see that in the half reaction, those solid silver atoms will attach to the electrode and you'll actually see this electrode will gain mass as it as solid silver atoms sort of attach or coat the outside. At the same time, my copper electrode is gonna decrease in mass as those solid copper atoms lose electrons, they become aqueous copper plus two and join the solution. This also means that the concentration of copper plus two is gonna be increasing while the concentration of Ag plus one is decreasing. In the salt bridge, we're gonna have negative ions flowing in that same clockwise direction as the electrons are. So in this case, I'm gonna have nitrate ions flowing to the left and the cations, in this case potassium, flowing in the opposite direction to the right. The electrodes themselves also have names. The one where the reduction takes place is referred to as the cathode. In this case, that would be the solid silver. And the one where the oxidation takes place is called the anode, in this case, the solid copper. You can calculate the voltage that your cell will produce by calculating something called the standard cell potential. To do that, you'd likely be given a reference called a standard reduction potential for each half reaction taking place in your electrochemical cell. So I can look up that silver's reduction potential is 0.8 volts and copper's reduction potential for this half reaction is 0.34 volts. But notice that copper here is not a reduction. It's being oxidized to represent the fact that the half reaction is flipped around. I change the reduction potential to a negative. Now to get the standard cell potential, I just add those two values together. Here I get a positive 0.46 volts. Notice the positive sign means that the reaction done in this direction is spontaneous with a K value greater than one and a negative value for delta G. So that's the voltage that your cell will produce under standard conditions where the solutions are one M, the pressures are one bar if there's gases and the temperature is 298 Kelvin. You can also make some predictions about what this would be like under non-standard conditions. We can do this by solving for Q to see how close these non-standard conditions are to equilibrium. For example, if the copper concentration in my cell was two, that means the Q value for the reaction is two. Since I know the K value is very large, a Q value for two means that these conditions are closer to equilibrium. And since at equilibrium, the voltage would drop to zero, I know that I will have a lower voltage than what I calculated under standard conditions. You could also solve for the exact value of that non-standard cell potential by plugging in that value for Q and the original voltage into the Nernst equation shown here. So let's close briefly by talking about electrolytic cells. There's some differences in the setup you'll notice right away, like there's only a need for one giant container. Along the wire will be the external power supply that's forcing this reaction to take place. And of course, there's no longer a need for a salt bridge. The good news is that pretty much everything we've done so far with galvanic and voltaic cells can be applied to electrolytic cells as well. Some key differences will be that if you calculate the standard cell potential, you'll notice that the value comes out as a negative voltage that makes sense, remember, because this reaction is not spontaneous and it would not happen on its own. For the same reason, these reactions will have K values less than 1 and positive delta Gs. 
Some common examples might include the electrolysis of water where H2O molecules are split into H2 and O2 gas, the electrolysis of salts, those salts typically have to be molten or dissolved in water, or electroplating where aqueous metallic ions are used to coat an object that's placed in the solution functioning as the electrode. For electroplating in particular, it's common to see questions about the current applied by the external power source and how much metal will be plated based on that value. Let's say we apply a current of 25 amps for two hours to a solution containing copper plus two ions. I can plug in those amps in that time into the current equation to solve for the amount of charge lowercase q that passes through the wire in that time. In this case, 180,000 coulombs. Then with Faraday's constant, I can see how many moles of electrons pass through the wire and then relate those moles of electrons to some quantity of solid metal that's gonna be plated, in this case, solid copper. I know it's two moles of electrons because it's a copper plus two changing into solid copper, so it must be two moles of electrons being transferred. And finally, converting that back to grams to see how much solid copper gets plated. In this case, around 59.2 grams. And that wraps it up for electrochemistry for AP Chem in 10-ish minutes or less. Thanks for watching.